Good. David. Hey everybody, this is hey everybody, this is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman. This is the 116th Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition Zoom call. Um, uh, we are uh, joined today by uh, David Hogg, of, uh, uh, who's one of the great young activists in America today. Uh, we're honored with his presence. He has come from the Parkland shooting. He only has a half hour to be with us. He's working with uh, John um, uh, Rosenthal and other organizations to get out the youth vote. Uh, we are going to give him uh, the first half hour to talk with us um, about uh, getting out the vote of young people in particular, uh, and also the impact of the gun issue on um, on, on the upcoming 22 election. Uh, David, we're uh, glad to have you with us. This is being recorded. It will be uh, sent out throughout the internet um, um, uh, 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 later on. Uh, are you with us? Can we hear you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, David, um, tell us, please, uh, I, I will tell you, uh, as I mentioned to you before, that um, uh, my best friend growing up lost his grandson, Max Schachter, um, in the shooting. I, I don't know if you knew him or not. Uh, he was a sweet young man and absolutely horrifying uh, what happened to him and the rest of your Classmates, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, tell us, please, uh, the nature of your campaigning right now and uh, the impact you expect to have on the 22 election. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Um, the work that we do, I, so I really have two main lanes of work that I do. One is at March for Our Lives, the organization that we started after Parkland, uh, after the Parkland shooting, uh, specifically aimed at turning out young people to vote for morally just leaders that put kids before guns and protect kids and not weapons like the AR-15, like the shooter at my high school used. And the other lane that I've started working on this year is helping to turn out uh, young people through uh, the campaign I'm doing with John, which is uh, America is Calling Vote. Um, John Rosenthal has been an advocate in gun safety in Massachusetts for over two decades now. Um, he's helped make these state of Massachusetts, uh, one the safest state in the United States in terms of gun violence prevention. Um, if every other state had the same gun laws or same gun death rate as Massachusetts, there would be 27,000 less gun uh, deaths every single year in this country. Um, and John came to me and said, I wanna work on a campaign to help turn out young people to vote an advertising campaign. So myself, along with Jacqueline Korn, who also is from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, my high school in Parkland, Florida, um, and is a fellow student uh, classmate of mine now, uh, are working with John to help turn out the youth vote, um, really by telling young people the work that has been done um, that we have turned out and voted. And that's what's enabled things like the first gun safety bill uh, in 30 years uh, to pass. It's, with this, it's what's enabled the Inflation uh, Reduction Act to pass, which has significant the most uh, massive amount of spending in American history on fighting climate change um, and things like student debt cancellation. So we're really trying to shift the message now with young people from going from, you know, they don't want you to vote, which obviously is true. We've seen across the country, uh, an interesting, uh, often not talked about part of voter suppression, which is youth voter suppression. Um, and we've seen places like Ohio try to raise the age to vote in primaries and things like that just recently um, over the past month. And um, anyways, we're trying to shift the message from just saying they don't want you to vote to this is why you, what happens when we did vote. Because in 2018, we had one of the highest youth voter turnouts in a non-presidential midterm in American history. And in 2020, we had the highest youth voter turnout ever in American history. Um, and right now, you know, despite what the, the boomer pundits, no offense, uh, say uh, over and over again, you know, they said in 2018, young people, young people aren't going to turn out because we don't give, we don't give a shit about politics. We turned out at record numbers. They said in 2020, we weren't going to turn out. We blew at all previous generations in terms of voter turnout uh, out of the water when they were our age. Um, we are voting at a higher rate than any other generation has in American history when they were between the ages of 18 and 29. It's still abysmally low, but it's also much higher than any previous generation has voted at when they were our age uh, and consistently turned out too. And I think we're, we're seeing 
some early indications, you know, despite low early voting numbers, we're seeing uh, young people, I, I think it was in Wisconsin recently, uh, just reporting yesterday, similar voter turnout, um, I think it was to 2020, which would be remarkable. Um, and I, I always say that if polls can be wrong about Republican turnout, as wrong as they were in 2016, you know, I think that they can be uh, also wrong for young turnout uh, and Democratic turnout as well. Um, and I think in this election, we have to remember the fact that young people are notoriously hard to uh, poll. I, I don't pick up phone numbers that I don't recognize. You know, so I think the polling is uh, could, is likely wrong that if it's showing you know young people are not turning out. Um, and yeah, so I'm hopeful that we're going to turn out at a similar rate to 2018 at minimum, uh, which would be a, a major uh, component of helping to keep a morally just majority um, that supports things like gun safety, supports things like fighting climate change and others in the House and Senate. Um, but, you know, we're going to see. So that's that's the main work that I've been doing. And I've also done some fundraising for my political candidates and on my personal side um, for candidates in Florida, including Maxwell Alejandro Frost from Val Demings uh, Congressional District, Florida's 10th. Uh, I raised him over $350,000. He's 25 years old and will probably be the first Gen Z. If, uh, it, depending, he will for sure be the first uh, Democratic Gen Z in Congress. His district is plus 14 um, for Dems. And for Val Demings, I've raised now over $700,000. Uh, so, you know, that's not close to the $3.3 million that Marco Rubio took from the NRA, but that's a lot of money. Um, and even if she doesn't win, which I really hope she does, and I think she can, um, I think it's a good message to send that, you know, because the NRA is seen as such a bad organization, people are willing to donate, you know, when a 22 year old asks them to donate to fight against the NRA's deadly agenda, you can raise at least a third of the money um, that was given to you by this massive multi hundred million dollar organization. Um, so that's the kind of work that I've been doing along with just focusing on trying to be at school as much as I can because um, I'm in my senior year. At what school are you at? I'm at Harvard. Harvard. I never heard of that. Where is it? It's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. All right. So um, uh, let me point out very quickly that um, the youth vote, which um, I guess, well, how do you define the youth vote right now, David? 18 to 29, 18 to 30. Okay, so the millennial generations are defined by, the generations defined by um, demographers as 1981 to 1996. Generally, they do these cohorts as roughly 15 years. So um, in the American electorate now, uh, and then the Zoomers, of course, are from 1996 to uh, uh, you know, 2011, 2012, something like that, right? So combined millennials and Zoomers are now half the electorate, if not more. And uh, the, the at least 50% of the eligibles to vote in the United States now are born after 1980. And uh, the millennials um, uh, are, of course, the most progressive generation in history, um, uh, uh, followed by the Zoomers, which may be more progressive. And I personally believe that a lot of that has to do with race. Uh, if you look at the racial makeup of the successive generations, the baby boom was more than 80% white. Um, uh, the Z Gen uh, Y um, is about 75% white. Uh, the the uh, millennials are in the 60s or uh, even high 50s, and the uh, Zoomers are barely uh, about 52% white. So uh, uh, that's a big piece, uh, as best we can tell, of the demographic, demographic puzzle. And uh, also, of course, the youth vote, which I, as a historian, consider the millennials and the Zoomers. Uh, voted over uh, more than 60% against Trump um, in, in uh, uh, okay, the meeting is now being live streamed. So that's good. Thank you for that, um, uh, Steve. Um, so uh, we're both being live streamed and, and uh, recorded. I do want to say one thing, David, we forgot to warn you. Because we're rebroadcast on the radio, we avoid four letter words. If you want to curse, you can do it in Yiddish. But uh, beyond that, uh, we we try we 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 do have a, a censorship problem. So um, um, 
if you, what is your a magic formula now for getting out the youth vote? I, I talked to John Rosenthal earlier. He's doing a mass tweet. Um, what base, what, and this is, uh, by the way, the, 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 um, the, we have 54 people on right now. It tends to grow. Um, what is your formula uh, for getting out the vote? Uh, what is your key, what are your key uh, tools? Well, uh, in 2018, it was anger um, and just <laughs> just tapping into the righteous indignation that um, every person who's ever been young knows um, the you know the the kind of rebellious attitude of telling young people just like you know the most powerful motivator to any young person, at least if they're a teenager, um, like we were when we started. I was 17 years old when Parkland happened. Um, the most powerful motivator to somebody like that is to tell them that your parents don't want you to or the adults don't want you to. So that was what kind of the energy that we used in 2018. Um, and what's been really amazing is that, you know, millions of students walked out of their high schools in 2018. And I, I, don't, I don't know if people would truly understand from historical perspective um, the cultural impact that has had on our generation. Because those young people, when they walked out in 2018, a lot of them couldn't vote. Um, in, uh, you know, 2018, because they weren't seniors in high school yet. And then in 2020, you know, more, some more of them could vote. Um, but now all of them that were in high school at the time right. are eligible to vote. Um, and it wasn't college students that were walking out necessarily. It was mostly high school and even a lot of middle school students that I've talked talk to that now are at college, you know, in college and stuff like that, talking about how that's why they were, they're now studying you know, just the other day, I was at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and a young man came up to me and said, you know, your, like, March for Our Lives and the walkout at my middle school is the reason why I am studying political science and started caring about politics in the first place. You know, so I, I think a lot of the work that we needed to do has kind of already been done because it's, it's been a cultural shift in the perspective of, of uh, Gen Z and making politics tangible. And also the fact that, frankly, Donald Trump did more than any president before in American history uh, to show young people the impact to make politics tangible to them and show them why it matters in a horrifying way. But he did. Um, and I think that's helped to motivate them. And now the message that we're trying to shift into, especially with America is calling vote, is going from just, you know, this angsty, you know, burn it all down attitude, which is valid at times. Um, but realizing that, yes, we have made progress and it has been slow because of things like the filibuster and otherwise, but we've made more young people, President, uh, the, you know, the current Congress that we have has done more to help young people, I would say, than arguably any Congress possibly since the 1950s or 60s. Um, and it's, I believe, because young people turned up and that we've shown our voice through things like Sunrise Movement, through things like March for Our Lives and others, demanding things, you know, like gun safety, climate change, addressing climate change and things like that. So the message that we're trying to do with America is calling vote is shift that cultural narrative within young people that I don't believe is sustainable, um, that I think, frankly, was one of the long term, unfortunate, you know, I, I don't know if I'd say it was a mistake, but one of the unfortunate things about the 1960s that happened was because of the total chaos of everything going on at that time, you know, and it was so decentralized and the government was repeatedly letting people down because of things like Vietnam, you know, and other things like that. And obviously systemic racism and all these other issues. That movement never fully transitioned to becoming institutionalized because it was so anti-establishment. And I think what happened is there was a, a counter revolution to that that happened within the conservative, within the Republican party. And we see this with the primary of Barry Goldwater, you know, and wanting to literally nuke Vietnam. We see this with the primary, you know, various Republican primaries, especially starting in Orange County, California, you know, later on in the 50s, later on in the 60s, going onward, where we see people take over their state GOP parties and make them further and further right wing. And this is when we start to see the coalition forming between evangelicals and conservatives, um, especially anti-abortion activists and anti-feminists. Um, and from that, they were able to, they were able to basically take all of the energy from the civil rights movement that was a counter to that, that was an equal and opposite reaction, except they put it 100% into being institutionalized power, starting from the ground level up. And I think with our generation, 
we have seen the power of that because they now have the Supreme Court. They now have gerrymandered all these places. We now have several dozen or in Congress, over 100 people running that are full-blown election deniers. We have people running for secretaries of state from the Republican Party that are election deniers and governor and attorney general and every single you know, uh, part of the ballot running across the country. And I think what we have to do is we have to take the anti-establishment energy that we started out with in 2018 and start electing young people like Maxwell Alejandro Frost and others, especially at the state level um, and in Congress to show young people that young people are involved in politics and we have to work through these institutions as much as possible to start gaining our power now. Because while we may not have billions of dollars, we have the second most valuable thing that anybody in politics can have, which is time, because we are gonna outlive everybody in Congress. <laughs> so, right. so it's yeah. about how do we how do we take those lessons from the 1960s and not repeat them at least the parts that are within our control um and that's the kind of focus that we have through america's calling vote is to show young people the impact that they have had voting and that while voting is part of the answer it is not it is not it is only just that it is just part of it it is right. one tool that you have in your toolbox but the message that we're sending to young people is if you truly are dedicated to creating change. It's not about having a sexy president or somebody that you're inspired by running on a, on a major ticket. You are voting in every election because that is just what we do. We are a generation of organizers. We're a generation of activists that want to create a better world for our children. And we know that's gonna take time. So in order to do that, we're not just voting in presidential elections, we are voting in every single election every single time the same way that you don't the same way that we aren't like oh wow the halloween candy this year isn't the best so i'm just not going to celebrate halloween we just celebrate it because it's natural because it's cultural we are trying to do the same thing with voting to turn out young people consistently and show them that it does work but you have to it is not something that changes overnight you have to continue turning out and it's not just being about burning everything down that's the easy part it's about what we're going to build in its place to actually build a more perfect union and help future generations. Because we have to start turning out now to un undo all the damage that has been done by these incredibly corrupt um, morally and politically uh, leaders that have brought us to this place. To the point that our children, you know, we're, we're seeing places like Texas not, not address how, somebody get, how an 18-year-old gets an AR-15 but instead send out DNA kits so parents can identify their children after they've been slaughtered in their schools. If that's not a sign of a failing political system, I don't know what is. But that's the kind of message that we're trying to show young people is that we, have, we know that this is our reality. We have to vote to start to change it. Voting is not the only part of that. There are many parts such as activism and organizing, but voting is one tool in our toolkit that we have to use because we're truly dedicated to creating a better world we have to work together and use every tool at our disposal. Excellent. Beautifully stated. I want to welcome John Rosenthal, your cohort on, and he's going to take the baton from you at 530. We know you have to go. Uh, as a boomer uh, who vaguely remembers the 1960s, uh, I actually did speak at Woodstock uh, in 1994. Uh, essentially, our generation, uh, I guess your parents' generation, uh, set out to uh, do two things. We set out to revolutionize the culture and to end the empire. And I think we did a pretty good job of revolutionizing the culture in many ways that you can't even- People wear pants with. now. And what's that? Women wear pants now. <laughs> well, women are about to take over. That's the, that's the big one. Uh, but we, so we did revolutionize the culture, but we did not end the empire. That's the job uh, that you, got, you guys are gonna have to do. And you beautifully stated that we have 63 people on the call. For those of you who joined us uh, late on the YouTube uh, live stream, we're here with David Hogg uh, from, of America is Calling and veteran of the Parkland shooting. He's joined by John Rosenthal, uh, the founder of America's Calling with David. Uh, we're talking about the generational changeover. Um, our, you two will have to come back after the election. On this call, we had a revolutionary occurrence where Andrea Miller of the Center for Common Ground was uh, linked up with um, uh, Ray McClendon of the uh, uh, Georgia NAACP. And together they did the grassroots organizing that swung the two Senate seats in 2021. And because, and one of the things that the prime, one of the primary things we 
advocate is the, uh, is taking the money that the Democratic Party, among others, has used for um, uh, to buy ads and shift it instead to grassroots relational organizing, which we know. And you know, we saw the positive result in Atlanta and Georgia in 2021, where the state of Georgia, against all odds, as a historian, I can tell you, elected a black man and a Jewish guy to the US Senate, to Virginia that fall, where the Democrats squandered millions of dollars on media advertising and did not pay their door-to-door -door canvassers and wound up with a Trumpian governor. So um, the, the basic rubric of organizing on the progressive side is what we're about. And of course, the youth vote, as I pointed out, half the electorate now was born after 1980. And more than half the electorate is women. And uh, you know, a big part of our messaging here on these calls is the rise of the power of women and the return of matriarchy. In the book I sent you to People's Spiral of US History, we discuss that the, the original democracies in North America, the indigenous tribes were matriarchies. And um, I, you know, after 5,000 years of male domination, uh, I think maybe we're, it's time for a change. So David, while we have you for six more minutes, um, I, I wanna call on Lynn Feinerman. Uh, she's got a question for you. Uh, and then Justin LeBlanc. Lynn, go ahead. Uh, are you unmuted? Yeah, I think so. Lynn um, is a radio host, David and uh, John, and a, a stalwart of our campaign and quite a brilliant woman. So go ahead, Lynn, please. Thank you very much. Those are very kind words. First, I wanna say a few kind words to you, David. I think you're awesome. I think your work is awesome. And I just want you to know, I wish you all strength and I'm just sending strength to you. So you keep on going and you keep on doing your work. The next question is very simple. What can we do to help you? Exactly. <laughs> Go ahead, please, David. Besides getting everyone you know to vote and voting yourself, obviously, um, you know, one of the biggest problems that I have had to deal with over the past couple of years and, you know, in March generally we've had is, it, it is just, frankly, I, I think liberals when it comes to uh, investing for change, if we were to have a metaphor for the stock market, liberals would be like trying to time the market on whatever new sexy technology there is out there and putting all of their eggs in one basket and just investing for one election cycle and then selling off once they you know it doesn't succeed whereas conservatives like the Koch brothers and others invest in a generalized index fund like the s p 500 for social change at every level consistently every year no matter the state of the market and from that they've been able to build an empire politically speaking from state legislatures school boards to, to congress to now the supreme court with the federalist society and others March for Our Lives needs sustainable su support. That's not just around one election. Um, this is gonna take more than one election to solve. And I've said from day one that the goal of March for Our Lives is to not exist anymore because we want gun violence to end. But until that day comes, we need sustainable support so that we can fund the unsexy things that make the sexy things possible. Things like funding our staff so that they have you know, a salary because they are the ones that actually give us the infrastructure to create the change in the first place. Because we can't just do this when, when this stuff gets in the news. It's an everyday process because kids are dying every day. So one, you know, uh, sustainable donations to March for Our Lives just once a month, you know, five or $10, whatever you can, huge help. March for Our Lives has a little bit of a problem in that we are kind of like, maybe this is problematic to say, but. I've always said that it's kind of like we're the we're like the prettiest girl like in high school who doesn't get asked to prom because everybody thinks she's already been asked. March for Our Lives is, is not a made one of those major. We're probably one of the smallest uh, national gun, national level gun violence prevention nonprofits. Um, yes, we have a, bu a bigger budget than obviously a lot of other gun violence prevention nonprofits at the more local level, but we're a national one that has you know kids across the country doing this work. We need sustainable support, and also America is calling. We could use your support too, obviously. But you know, my heart is always going to be with March first because that's what I've been doing for the past five years. So that is what you can do. Thank you. Um, you can put the link in the chat. Justin LeBlanc, then Emily Levy, uh, then Wendy, and, and David. I want to emphasize that we uh, we need you and uh, John to come back after the election to meet with uh, uh, Andrea Miller 
uh, Ray McClendon uh, and, uh, and uh, um, Ray Lutz is on here, are people who have really pioneered grassroots organizing in an extremely successful way that has moved the dial significantly on American politics. Okay, uh, Justin, then Emily, then Wendy. Hey, David, I'm glad you're uh, showing up to represent the country here, uh, especially the people of your generation. The, uh, you mentioned about putting all your eggs in one basket. I'm wondering uh, how to break out of that, like alliances between uh, academia and working class inner cities, uh, alliances between city and rural folks, uh, things such as you know, public transportation, safe uh, uh, pathways to work. You know, what are your thoughts all along those lines? I think coalitions can, and activism can actually be very dangerous. Um, and I didn't used to think that way, but after doing a lot of research myself in college on the kind of political science and papers that have been done about social movements, ones that form coalitions amongst a lot of spaces um, dissolve very quickly and become quite disastrous because the second that somebody, for example, you know, wants to, you know, the way that those coalitions get broken up is they say, you know, oh, we'll do this thing in, in A subject area, but not in B subject area. So it just causes people to be divided. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think people should work together. I think they, they should listen to each other and try to focus on things that everybody does agree is something that they need to turn out voters more, such as voter turnout, obviously, you know, something that creates a rising tide for everybody. But um, I think the best thing that we can do in terms of working together is, you know, just uh, advertising the work that we're doing more uh, through social media, um, especially for young people uh, to let them know and doing more in person, you know, outreach. But even more than that, I think we need to make movements fun. Um, as hard as these things are, um, people, people burn out a lot. And I don't think that we are ever going to succeed long term if we're constantly just uh, reacting to stuff and we're not acting proactively. And I also think that we need to focus on emphasis on building culture and having fun together just as much as doing the work in the first place, because I believe it's from community and, you know, doing fun things together that sustainability, you know, or persistence is built. And from that, you're eventually able to succeed, but it does take a long time, but it's in those moments where you're able to be around other people that you're able to, you know, yeah. kind of succeed. So as my buddies, uh, Ben and Jerry said, if it's, if it's not fun, why do it? Well, there are a couple of serious uh, heroes of the, voter protection movement went on with this John Brakey of, from Arizona, who put down the, uh, the ninjas, so-called in Arizona, Lynn Bernstein, who's taken some serious heat for her organizing in North Carolina. And I'm gonna call on Emily Levy, who has a, a group called Scrutineers that you should know about. Go ahead, Emily, please. And David, I, I know it's 5.30. If you have to run, uh, uh, let me know. We have John Rosenthal on with us as well, but Emily, go ahead, please. Thank you, David, so much for being here and for your work. And I'm sorry that it's been at such a, a great cost to you personally to be in this movement and to have arrived in this movement. Um, I have a, a two quick questions. One is, how do you respond to progressive people who say more gun control laws would only be um, enforced against people of color and wouldn't actually solve the first question? And my second question is, in addition to encouraging um, young people to register to vote and to vote, are you trying to mobilize them around the elections in any other way? And if you don't have things to give them to do, we do, and I'd love to connect with you about it. Right, she's particularly referring to uh, monitoring at the polls, vote counting, uh, protecting voters as they show up, things like that. Um, not exactly, but- I, oh, Sorry, didn't want to put um, in your mouth. Those are things that we've talked about on the calls. Yeah, so um, I think the, can you remind me of the first part of your question? Sorry. The first part was about people who say that that gun control. Oh, got it. You're right, 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 right. Um, well, I think that's that speaks more broadly to the, the issues that we already have at hand, which is a corrupt criminal justice system that we know disproportionately affects the most marginalized of our society. Um, if we if we just focused on uh, 
not creating laws in the first place because they're going to disproportionately affect people because of that entire system being messed up that we wouldn't create laws period and that that to me that's not the answer i think we need to have a holistic approach to addressing um not just how somebody gets a gun you know we need to take a similar approach to what we did with cigarettes and i i think what i mean by that is we need to address the how and the why we have to address the culture too um and the fact that the you know, cities like Parkland don't have shootings on a daily basis. And it's not because we have stronger gun laws than Miami-Dade County that often does have shootings on a daily basis. It's because we have resources. We have to attack this issue from the how and the why. We have to address why are young people picking up a gun in the first place? Because it is disproportionately young people that are committing these acts of violence, not just mass shootings, but everyday acts of gun violence. And also the two thirds of gun deaths that are suicides that are, you know, I would often consider deaths of despair um, because they happen disproportionately in rural America um, with older men, middle-aged men uh, that have access to guns. And I think we have to address the why of both of those. We have to address the why, you know, our farmers and people in rural areas have so much divestment, uh, so such a lack of investment um, and so much money getting pulled from there. And these communities are falling apart Right. And the systems that have enabled that, especially big agriculture, really being exploiting, uh, super exploitive to smaller scale farmers um, because they're just trying to squeeze out that extra dollar from each one of them and essentially sending them into bankruptcy. But it also means addressing redlining, which is one of the top predictors of where shootings occur in the United States is where communities were redlined by the U.S. government. We have to address both of those. And I can't I, I don't think it can be an either or. And I, I think what that looks like is things that like non carceral based systems to help stop shootings before they happen. And what these are called, are called, they're called uh, violence intervention programs. And what they do is they get a culturally trained, competent, you know, therapist that looks like the community and it's from the community and often themselves, you know, I've worked around people like this before people that have come out of prison after themselves killing people that then go and work and stop young people from going down that same path. And from that, they're able to stop retaliation. Because along with redlining, the top predictor of who shoots somebody else in this country is whether or not that person has been shot themselves or if they somebody they know has been shot because it's retaliation. So the way that we can stop this violence in the first place isn't just laws. It's stopping people from using guns, culturally speaking, in the first place by making them uncool, making them unsexy like we did with cigarettes and in, investing in programs that work to stop shooting before they happen by making sure young people that are at risk don't continue going down that path instead of investing in more broken systems like policing that only are able to respond as a shooting is about to break out or most of the time after somebody's already been killed or shot themselves, at which point I would say they've already failed, right? So I, we need to invest in the prevention side of it uh, in the first place and address you know, the entire criminal justice system as a whole as well, especially things like cash bail, things like that. Fantastic. The second part of your question, Emily. Um, Emily, I should tell you, her, her scrutineers group does a superb uh, a training uh, around elections and has been really essential to the election protection movement. And you should be in touch, uh, you and John, with, with Emily. Go ahead, Emily. Real quick, your second. So my I know second. A second. We're, we're turning out young people. You know, we, we, we have a whole volunteer base and an organizing team that helps turn out young people. But, but honestly, Emily, I I don't think young people, it, it would be great if you had more young people to help look at elections and ballot boxes and stuff like that. Young people don't have time, it, it, honestly. Um, we don't have 401ks for the most part that are anywhere near retirement. Um, we don't have our SEP IRAs set up. We don't have all these other things. We, have, we don't have time. It is not, unfortunately, we are not living in the post-World War II economy of the 1950s and 60s anymore where young people can take out a ton of time to become politically involved. It's often the people with, it's, it's a very privileged process to be able to have that amount of time. Many people have jobs, you know? So I would say we're also a smaller population too, comparatively speaking to the boomer population, because if you look at the population graph, you literally have a larger population uh, in, in many regards, and, or at least you have a lot more time typically. We need older people to go out there and watch polls more, which they do already, but we need more of them instead of calling on young people to do even more than we're already being asked to do in the first place. Because the number one thing that I want young people focused on doing is just turning out and voting in the first place. It, even if it's just that, it's a bare minimum. 
Emily, do you want There's to one know? particular election night action that takes about a half an hour once that might be a good match. So um, if John's going to be on for the rest of the call, he'll hear about it and maybe we can connect about it later. Thank you so much. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, guys. And please donate. Uh, David, thank you very much for being with us. You missed meeting Wendy uh, this time, but next time when you come back, uh, we'll give her the first question um, and we'll connect you with uh, with Emily more thoroughly and also with um, Ray McClendon and Andrea Miller. Uh, we're now joined. I want Great to job, David. Nice to see you, buddy. Thank you, David. Um, um, uh, no nukes. Um, I hope when you were in San Luis Obispo, you went over and got arrested at the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant. We can talk to you about that later as well. So thank you for being with us. We really appreciate it. All right. Uh, we're now joined by John Rosenthal. I want to re remind everyone we are uh, uh, live uh, webcasting on. YouTube, this is being recorded uh, for posterity and will also be uh, uh, broadcast on the Progressive Radio Network uh, Thursday night. Uh, we do have more than 70 people on the call. John Rosenthal is in also in Boston. Uh, well, you're in Gloucester, I, I believe. And um, one of the great organizers, a fellow no nuker, uh, John and I uh, each uh, shared residency at the San Luis Obispo County Jail, um, um, trying to stop the Diablo. Canyon nuclear plant, and we're now in the midst of trying to shut it down. Uh, David, go ahead. You, if you'll tell us, please, about America is Calling and the tremendous organizing you're doing to get out the youth vote, that would be fabulous. Thanks for having me. Um, and I hope you, I'm sure you you enjoyed David. I mean, fabulous. it's uh, it's really quite remarkable. I mean, the uh, you know, the most public facing thing that David Hogg did before the Parkland massacre was uh, being a Boy Scout leader. <laughs> and um, yet he went to school in one of the greatest school systems in Florida and had civics and history and TV production and debate classes. And it turns out, you know, his issue was gun violence. Um, and that was what he debated. And he was used to being in front of a camera. And, you know, unlike the babies at Sandy Hook and their families, you know, these teenagers uh, were, were basically prepared um, to talk about gun violence at a time uh, and talk about, talk about it differently. And, and he and I met as a result of, um, I'm a gun owner and a business person and, and live in Massachusetts. I started an organization called Stop Handgun Violence um, when I learned that in 19... Um, 94, uh, 106 Americans died every single day, including 15 kids under 19. And frankly, if you go back to 1975, that's more Americans killed by firearms in America than all US servicemen and women killed in all foreign wars combined. Um, and uh, I, I set out to try and turn bad public policy into good public policy and uh, and good public health outcomes. And so we changed the conversation in Massachusetts from the polar extremes of unlimited access to guns or banning all guns to how our kids, criminals and dangerously mentally ill folks who are prohibited from getting guns, accessing them without detection. We passed a series of laws since 1994. Uh, we reduced the rate of gun deaths by 40% in Massachusetts. We have the lowest firearm fatality rate in the nation, uh, along with Hawaii, and we proved that gun laws save lives. Um, and we, we did it again by changing the conversation and exposing um, the insane public policy in America that regulates toy guns and teddy bears, but not real guns. Um, and, um, and we created a model. Lo and behold, Massachusetts, also home of Smith and Wesson and George Washington's Armory, makes more firearms in almost any state in the nation, including the weapons um, used, the weapon used at Parkland. Um, that uh, that Smith and Wesson AR-15 um, that slaughtered 17 and, and shot 17 more at Parkland, um, or you know, hit 71 people in the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. Um, you know, killing 12 was one of the many used at Las Vegas uh, that where 450 people were shot in set in minutes. Um, 
It is not allowed to be owned in Massachusetts. It is not allowed to be sold in Massachusetts, uh, but Smith & Wesson uh, makes it here and exports death elsewhere. So David and I met because we did a march from Worcester 50 miles to Smith & Wesson um, with, with survivors uh, from Parkland. Um, and, uh, and, and then he, real, he quickly realized um, that rather than, you know, the March for Our Lives having to reinvent um, what the solutions to gun violence are, they should just simply replicate the model that we've created over the last almost 30 years, uh, improving that gun laws save lives without banning most guns. And he and I have been, um, we've become very close friends and, 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 and speaking about the having fun part, you know, I, I'm continually reminded by, you know, Emma Goldman's quote, if I can't dance, I don't want to join your revolution. And, you know, David and I uh, have worked together while sailing and enjoying nature. Um, and nonetheless, um, it comes to, all comes down to uh, these issues that we care so much about in the future of, uh, frankly, of, of our children and grandchildren, you know, is now come down to the future of freedom and democracy. I mean, it is not hyperbole to say that Vladimir Putin had a puppet in the White House for four years. He would still be there, but for 42,000 votes in five states. That's how close we came, as far as I'm concerned, to the end of freedom and democracy. Not to say that it, it wouldn't change in the future, but it's a lot harder to get it back once you've lost it. And um, you know, you can you can look at the electoral college and you know and understand the systemic issues around rep, you know minority government in America, but that's the way it's been. Um, but we haven't seen such an assault on freedom and democracy as we have seen um, with, with the Trump um, Bannon approach. And if you haven't read the book, How Democracies Die by Zeblitz and uh, Levitsky at Harvard, pick it up. Um, it John, is the- you are, you are importantly, and this is a, an election protection and GOTV of, of, of a constituency, you very importantly are pioneering an incredible campaign to get out the youth vote in particular and votes in general. And you told me earlier in the day that you've done a, a Twitter buy um, or, or a social media buy aimed at getting young people out. Can you uh, put that link in the chat and send it to Steve so that we can maybe play the 30 second spot that you I, ju I just sent it to you, Harb, if you can um, pull okay. it up. If you can send it to Steve S. Caruso one or put it in the chat, Steve can pick it out of the chat, our engineer here who's being a one-armed paper hanger today. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you can uh, send it to him, he'll put it up and we'll we'll take a look. So what what's the... Uh... The chat, can you put it in the chat? Yeah, no, I know. Who do I send it to? Uh, Steve, well, you can send it to everyone, but it's Steven Engineer. He's the one driving the train. Yeah, Steven Engineer, uh, okay. I, I'm not sure I can just cut and paste it. Um, okay, the I'll links. see if I can dig it up too. But so, you have the links. But, but, so tell so us about what, what, what you're doing, John. Sure. Exactly. So what we did um, is if you haven't heard of a, a world-renowned um, creative, branding design creative by the name of Bruce Mao. Check him out, M-A-U. Um, I saw a documentary about the work he had done. Um, he was hired by Coca-Cola to come up with a new brand. He came up with Coca's Life, Live Positively and Sustainable Plastics. Um, he literally redesigned Mecca after 717 people were trampled there. And the, the education minister in Guatemala hired him to, uh, to come up with a curriculum around democracy in an autocratic country. Um, I literally got in touch with him and hired him 
to help rebrand democracy. And I said that the thing we need first is a slogan that doesn't have to be explained, like Uncle Sam needs you, like it's morning in America, Reagan, or stop the steal, make America great again. We came up with America is calling, vote. Answer the call, stand up for freedom and democracy, vote. The idea was to combat voter suppression like we are seeing like never before. Um, the, the MAGA Republican approach to politics is suppress and repress votes because they know if people come out and vote, they're not gonna vote for them. So the idea was to come up with a nonpartisan, bipartisan reminder of the importance of our civic duty to vote. And, um, and then we went out and tested it. America is calling, the future is calling, freedom is calling, answer the call. The calling, you know, like a religious calling um, resonated really well. Um, but voter engagement voted quite, uh, was there was a serious deficit among young people. Um, I mean, remember David and his cohort, you know, born after 2000, have never known the American dream. They have never known a day in school without the risk of being shot, 9-11, uh, you know, Trump, uh, a violent insurrection at the US, an armed insurrection at the US Capitol. So the idea was, we had to get, and when they came out in 18 and 20, in fact, it, they came out in higher numbers than ever before. And in, in 2020, 66% of the electorate came out to vote and we threw Trump out only by 42,000 votes. Um, we need the same or better turnout in, um, in, in the midterms, uh, which typically go against the sitting president and then ultimately in 24, and we need to build a movement. Um, there's a long history of, of uh, student movements and young people changing policy and changing um, bad public policy in America, stopping the war in Vietnam, bringing about the vote, civil rights. I mean, democracy's always been aspirational. It's never, and liberty, never been pure in any way, shape or form, but it's under attack like never before. So. We raised a couple million dollars, um, and the idea was that we would. Uh, here's one of our ads focused at young people. Go ahead, play it, Steve. They please. said we wouldn't vote, but we showed them student loan relief helping millions, a game changing investment in climate and clean energy, and the first gun safety bill passed in 30 years. We did that. So if anyone thinks we're going to let extremists undo it all, let the big corporations continue to hoard wealth and let fanatics pass a national abortion ban, no, f that. This is about our freedom, our safety. We'll show them once again. Let's go vote. Wow. Okay. That's Wait. one. And Stephen, there's another one if you want um, to yeah. show that. Um, we have, so this is a digital campaign. Um, we are up in New Hampshire, North Carolina, two stinks saturated uh, with investment. Um, we really wanted to buttress uh, and help save the Senate seats um, and gain Senate seats. Here we go again. Here's the second one. Go ahead. The ultra rich, big oil and gun makers, they don't want us to care. They want to keep their power and their private jets at the expense of our safety and our clean air and water. But no more. We showed up in record numbers and we forced big changes. And we will do it again to protect kids in school, to keep our air and water clean and healthy. We're answering the call for our freedom, for our future. Let's vote. Okay. Excellent. Now, where did those go? So those um, went up, they've been running in New Hampshire for about three weeks, uh, North Carolina. And as of today, we just uh, bought a week um, of digital uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, what do you mean by digital? Where, 
Where did you put it exactly? So Facebook, Instagram, streaming, um, you know, phones, where kids are, um, not on television for the most part. I mean, Apple TV is included, but um, in targeted um, to where young people are to remind them and motivate, inspire them to vote. Um, as a result of them voting in 18 and, and 20, um, we have uh, finally, you know, created some change in Congress. Um, and uh, through, you know, the, the MAGA Republican out of the White House. Now, he hasn't gone away. Um, and the efforts to suppress votes are, are very targeted um, at basically, you know, the House and the Senate. Um, and then the big fight will be, uh, you know, in 24. So this is about creating a youth movement around civic engagement and voting. Um, they have the most to win and the most to lose, uh, but it's gotta be more than just, you know, every uh, election cycle. It's gotta be a sustainable movement of young people. Um, you know, the baby boomers uh, are the last generation to have it better. Um, uh, than our parents and shame on us for the world that we have created uh, for young people um, who, you know, don't know uh, what even, you know, the aspirational American dream was, never mind uh, having a chance at it and owning a home and a whole lot of other things that we, we benefited from, uh, but the next generations are not. And it's time um, that this youth, youth movement you know, take control because uh, our generation has dramatically dropped the ball. So that's what um, America's calling is about. And, um, you know, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that we may uh, hold the Senate or even gain a seat. I think we will lose the House. Um, and, um, and if it's between uh, DeSantis and Trump, um, God help us. Because uh, they're both, you know, horrors. And I'll leave you with one comment, and then we can get into questions. But I had dinner with Mark Kelly from Arizona. I mean, the guy, you know, four trips to the space station, 397 takeoff and landings, you know, off of aircraft carriers. You know, he talked about January 6th, and he and a few other senators were thinking about maybe trying to hold their ground in the Senate chamber. Uh, when the armed insurrectionists, uh, you know, stormed the Capitol. And, you know, he, he turned white telling me about the arms that he saw people carry when he realized he, there was no way they could hold the Senate. And, um, and then he went on, we talked about, you know, Trump and DeSantis and, and he said, John, I'm actually, you know, the, I'm more worried uh, about, DeSantis winning, one, he's, he's smarter, and two, there will be war. I mean, Trump will, will incite a civil war. And he said, in that sense, I think I'd rather have Trump win. I mean, that's we are on the verge of the end of democracy in America. One and thing so, that hasn't been discussed much about the Senate also is judicial appointment. But Biden has been very slow to make judicial appointments, and uh, the Senate controls them. If if the Senate is lost, you know the judiciary is going to be lost. Trump appointed over two hundred judges, and I don't know how many Biden has. Yeah, but it's it's nowhere near that. Uh, John, uh, can you take a question from Wendy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wendy Happy was was up uh, with uh, David Hogg, and then we'll go to um, uh, Mary. Um, Wendy, do you want to carry over your question? You want to? Uh, uh, just skip it. Um, thanks. I was just, I was just, I appreciate you being here. I'm actually, I'm from Fort Lauderdale. So I wanted to say hi to David and, and thank him. And I'll um, just let him know that I'm with the um, state progressive caucus. I'm close with the president. So if you guys want to link up and we can see how to support each other, but um, we can reach out later or keep the conversation okay. going moving forward. Thank you. And John, I want to make sure, as I mentioned to David, you come back, you need uh, with your campaigning to meet uh, Ray McClendon, from the Georgia NAACP and Andrea Miller from the um, Center for Common Ground and other, uh, John Steiner and other great people who do uh, focus on grassroots organizing. Uh, you are, we also have John Brakey on the call, uh, who's the key to the 
uh, democracy movement in Arizona. So after the election, we will have you guys back and have a major brainstorm. As, as, as I've mentioned to you, a major focus of ours is to shift money uh, from the traditional Democratic Party purchase of major media buys to grassroots organizing, which made the difference in Georgia 2021 and has really changed the world. Um, uh, Mayor, um, uh, Mary St Butler and then anyone else who wants to ask, please raise your hand. Mary, if you'll go for 90 seconds, that would be great. We got three minutes left to the segment, end of the segment. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll continue as Steve, as long as John is with us. Steve is uh, gonna have a nervous breakdown in the middle of this guy. <laughs> he's really running the show here and he's he's in Southern o Central. Probably Ohio. not his first barbecue working with you, Slogo. <laughs> all right, go ahead, Mary, please. Okay, John, first of all, I've always thought that in order for us to keep a grip on gun control, we should actually have ballistics of every gun that's manufactured and before it's resold, ballistics has to be done and be put on a database. So that way, when we find a bullet on the scene, we can find the gun. Secondly, we could reduce a lot of this at schools if we had more stringent bullying laws, because 90% of these kids that go crazy were victimized for years and years and years and nobody did anything. And then finally, Hooray on 16 and up being allowed to vote because if you're young enough to die for your country, you should be a young enough to vote for it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, let me just, truth is stranger than fiction when it comes to gun policy. You know, I mentioned the fact that, you know, <clears throat> that we, we, we regulate toy guns, but we don't regulate real guns. I mean, when you hunt in America, everyone has to get a hunting license. Now, there's no license requirement for hunting. There's no, I mean, for, for owning or purchasing a gun, there's no background check requirement in 32 states. Um, but when you do hunt, you are required to have a license. And when you hunt deer, you're limited to five rounds. When you hunt duck, you're limited to three rounds to protect the duck and deer population. When you hunt humans, no limit. We give police officers 13 to 17 rounds in their service weapons to protect us. Congress gives 35 to 100 round magazines to outgun cops and kill as many people as possible without having to reload. The, peop the kids at Sandy Hook, and I met there, in many, I, you know, I meet parents of dead children every day since 1990, every week since 1994. The AR-15, I was on MSNBC after Sandy Hook with General McChrystal, and he was describing what the AR-15 and the 223 round is designed to do. It's a, it's a round and it's a weapon of war. The round is designed to not to penetrate your body, but to hit your body and expand. The entry wound is like this. The exit wound is like this. And those children, like the children in all over that are being hit by these AR-15s, have to be identified by their clothing because they're indistinguishable looking. These are weapons of war. There's no purpose in a civilized society for them. And gun policy in America is basically you deregulate guns, you give immunity to the, to, against lawsuits to the industry, you have no manufacturing standards. You have no background check requirement. You have no licensing requirement like an automobile. In order to increase gun violence, increase fear, and increase gun sales for the uniquely unregulated gun industry. And all we did in Massachusetts, we treat guns like cars. Safety training, you got to lock up your gun if you're not in, in your direct control licensing, renewable licensing like automobiles. We ban military style weapons and large capacity ammunition magazines designed to outgun cops. We have proven that you can re effectively reduce injuries and deaths without banning guns. And if every state had the same gun death rate, now we only ban military style weapons and cheap Saturday night specials without safety features in the Commonwealth. If every state had the same low gun death rate as Massachusetts, 27,000 lives would be saved. Somebody's got a ban. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, say that again, John. 
if every state had the same low gun death rate per 100,000 population as Massachusetts, which is an urban state, 27,000 lives would be saved a year without banning anything except for assault weapons and cheap Saturday night specials. Um, there's the hope, but there isn't the political will. Um, and we have got to change Congress in order to change national gun laws. Okay, John, John Rosenthal, you're magnificent. Um, uh, your group is um, America's Calling. You're also involved with David Hogg at March for Our Lives. Uh, and if stop you, handgun we'll, violence. And stop handgun violence if you can. And we want you back, as I mentioned, that meet Andrea Miller, Ray McClendon, and other um, stalwarts of the grassroots uh, emergency election protection movement. We do have on with us two great heroes, Lynn Bernstein and John Brakey. So I'm hoping you can stay a bit back past the break. We'll take two more questions for you. Sure. Uh, we'll break the tape and we will, um, uh, we're continuing to live stream uh, on YouTube and we'll use your, you and David, your tape on a PRN uh, show uh, Thursday night. Uh, go ahead, Justin LeBlanc and then Alex Williams and then we're gonna break. Um, we won't turn it off. We're just gonna break the tape and we'll go to John Breaking and Bernstein and our discussion on uh, election protection, Richard. Uh, uh, Dan Wolf as well. Go ahead, uh, uh, Justin and Alex. So John, I, we've heard you talk a lot about the technical aspects of guns, uh, but I'm curious about the cultural aspects as David mentioned as well. Uh, one of the things that I was well aware of is a program uh, that makes drunk driving unsexy offered during basically uh, high school homecoming half times. It's an immersive program where people who are most at risk for that kind of behavior are actually put in the drama so they can experience the uh, feeling of the consequences. Um, so I'm wondering if something similar is being done in terms of gun violence uh, and to make shooting unsexy. Uh, the other thing is uh, when it comes to, uh, some people have said, you know, doing things on social media platforms, I, I find that to be actually much less effective, kind of like uh, knocking on doors is much more effective for getting out voters than uh, doing TV ads. Um, but do, if you got any thoughts on that, Appreciate yeah, that. I started this whole effort back in 94 because I bought a building next to Fenway Park uh, that had uh, uh, frontage on the Massachusetts Turnpike. And I wanted to put up a message that might have an impact on some bad public health policy and, and change it to good public health policy. And that's when I learned about gun violence and built a 250 foot billboard on the Mass Pike put up beautiful, 15 beautiful color photographs of kids killed by guns and said the cost of handguns keeps going up, 15 kids killed every day. And we would change that over the years. And I mean, literally presidents would tell me they would change their entourage route to see this billboard. And every legislator saw the billboard. And so it was like a front page and it ended up being the sort of the catalyst of changing the conversation from the polar extremes uh, and ultimately uh, getting gun bills passed. Uh, three out of four of our gun bills were passed or literally signed into law by Republican governors in, in the Commonwealth. So we, we effectively did change the conversation from the polar extremes without you know, um, demonizing gun owners. Um, I mean, the fact is, you know, there is a culture in America around guns, um, but it does not, and the majority of gun owners support, you know, banning assault and background checks. Um, yeah, and, and clearly, as David said, you know, having gun violence, um, um, you know, prevention curriculums and and um, and anti-bullying and you know all kinds of things. But what we find is, you know, there's a mass shooting of four or more people every single day. I mean, today another hundred plus people will die. And, it, and it's never about the gun. It's always about, you know, sort of mental illness or this, that, and the other thing. The fact is every country has mentally ill people. No other country arms them with military style assault weapons without detection. So, I mean, we have to address the, the firearm and unrestricted access to the firearm to have the biggest impact in the shortest period of time. Clearly, long term, you know, you got to deal with with violence and um, the male violence and and you know a lot of things. But when you look at you know you look at Detroit versus Windsor, you look at Van, you know Seattle versus you know uh, Vancouver. 
everyone sees the same stuff. The difference is easy access to guns. There is very little gun violence in Canada, and there's an epidemic in America, and it's about easy access to guns. Right, and um, uh, it's it's quite shocking, actually. And of course, we hope this plays out in the election um, that you'll you'll be able in this and f f further elections, future elections, to got tie gun deaths to um, uh, uh, electoral issues and, and getting out the vote. Alex Williams, you'll have the last question here. We're going to let John um, sum up, and then we definitely, John. I hope you can stay and meet with John Brakey and Lynn Bernstein. Sure. Others, that will be terrific. Go ahead, Alex. Alex Wimmer. Yeah, Wimmer. thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for being there. Um, I agree with the, the whole the gun thing. I think it is, uh, first of all, it's crazy that there's, you need, they limit you to three rounds or five rounds for hunting deer or ducks. I mean, that, that and, but unlimited for people. I mean, but anyway, um, that gets my, what I want to say. I think it's a both and. Um, the culture has to change so that people don't have to show their manhood or womanhood or whatever by pulling guns or beating up people. And I think that has to do with faith of some kind. I don't care what kind of faith it is, but you, you have to be, believe in a power greater than yourself so that you can get outside of yourself. But then at the same time, and, and care about other people. Then at the same time, we have to get rid of these crazy gun laws. I mean, get, I mean, put in place get the right. gun regulations. You know, no, like, like he said, nobody should have an AR-15. Nobody. There's no reason for that. Um, and yeah, you know, why can't you limit the amount of rounds you carry? You do it for ducks. Why not people? Um, well, here's yeah. the question. Why are these people showing up at the polls now in Arizona and elsewhere with guns? Uh, to intimidate potential voters, yeah. and why has the court uh, not intervened? You can, you can, well. you can get arrested <laughs> for bringing pizza to people standing in line waiting to vote, but if you show up with a gun, that's perfectly fine. It's insane. Totally well, that's insane. the last. That that's the this is one last thing I wanted to say. I think it might be time for for America to split, because. <laughs> <laughs> you know why these people are doing what they're doing. And I don't see us, we, we live in a state by state system and the crazies are spread out. They might be concentrated in the South and Midwest, but they're really spread out everywhere. And I, I don't, I, I just don't see us being able to have nice things with them, with them around. They just, <laughs> they, they won't allow it. We already see it. They will not allow it. So they, you, We can't you, have um, gun control because of them. Are you advocating we set up uh, asylum states for people who are, you know, of, of one mind? I'm uh, secession. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Only so, this time, uh, the North that, does it. <laughs> on that note, um, um, uh, uh, John, thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, John, we, we, uh, we're going to give you, we still, we're more than 70 people on the call still, um, and we're still being live streamed, which we're going to continue with. Do you want to have a last word, then we're going to break the tape, and we yeah. will start. Sure. Look, um, those of us that are on this call are lucky enough to be able to think about this stuff. And it's incumbent upon us um, to participate in our democracy. I, I got involved in this issue. I got involved as an activist you know, at high school um, where my English teacher said, we we're gonna do something different. And he showed the actual Holocaust films. Wow. He showed the black and white films, the emaciated bodies, the bulldozers in the trenches. And I realized if I were born then and there with my last name, I'd be dead. So do something with your good fortune. And there are more of us than there are of quote them. That's right. And you know, Bill Bryson in one of his great books wrote, you know, if you're lucky enough to live to be 90, that's 780,000 hours, that's all you get. And what you do with those moments and those hours is all you have and who you connect with is all you really ever have. So we have, we have this ability, you know, I think balance, the more you have, the more you have to give. And balance is probably the most important word in our, vo our vocabulary. And second is probably connection and how we connect. You know, Margaret Mead said it beautifully. 
never doubt what a small group of passionate citizens can do to change the world. Indeed, it's all that ever has. So it's on us, folks. It's okay. on us. We can turn this ship around, um, but it's getting harder. And, it, and more of us need to connect and commit um, to justice and, well, uh, and fight intolerance. Thank you for that, John Rosenthal. Put your links in the chat, please. This has been the first hour of the 116th Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition Zoom call, the Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Zoom call, the Green Green. Uh, we have had more than 70 people on for almost all the call. And uh, we are gonna break the tape right now. This will, first hour will uh, air at the Progressive Radio Network, Thursday night, 5 p.m. based out of New York. And uh, it has been live streaming. We're continuing to live stream. Thank you again. John Rosenthal, and thank you for bringing us David Hart. And as I'm dead serious, we will come back and talk to you about uh, the in incredibly important uh, steps forward in grassroots organizing. Um, our second hour, um, uh, 